This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory of Anna Maria Sosha. May her soul be elevated in heaven. Now, I know some of y'all prefer that I tone down the energy in the Parsha podcast, and I really, really want to make you happy. But this week, I just can't contain myself. I'm so eager. I'm so excited to share this Parsha podcast with you. What an amazing day. What an amazing moment. What an amazing Parsha. What joy and delight that we can get together once a week and study the Almighty's Holy Torah together. I hope you're doing well. I hope you are in good health and great spirits. We're coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My name is Yaakov Wolby. This is the Parsha Podcast. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. And let's begin. In our Parsha, Parsha's Vayetze, Jacob undertook and pulled off an improbable, nay, impossible mission in our Parsha. He travels naked and penniless to a foreign country. Rashi tells us that on the way he was robbed of all his possessions except a walking stick. And he's going to this foreign country to find a wife. And he has no assets. And he has to get the wife from the wiliest trickster of all time. Not only that, he has to beget a nation. And he has to avoid pitfalls. He has to avoid getting corrupted by Laban's sins. And he has to manage four wives and all their children and all their competitiveness. And he has to return to Isaac with the nascent nation in tow. And Jacob pulls it off marvelously, flawlessly. He gets the four wives. He gets the 12 children. He maintains his complete fidelity to God. Next week's partial we read how he tells Esav that he, despite being in the proximity of Laban, the sinner, he maintained all 630 mitzvos. He survives the 20-year encounter with Laban and emerges unscathed. If you think about it, in our Parsha, it details the story of the founding of our nation. Jacob, of course, that's his Parsha, is going to be renamed Israel. And the reason is because Jacob has his individual identity, but he is also the last of the forefathers. He is the one who has the 12 sons and the 12 tribes. He's the one who founds really the nation of Israel. Israel was destined to have 12 tribes, and Jacob slash Israel was the one to do it. How did he do it? What went in to him accomplishing this most improbable feat in our parsha, starting off with nothing, starting off without any assets at all, and emerging from the parsha at the end, heading back to Israel, to Canaan, heading back to his father Isaac with 12 children and with the beginnings of a great nation. How did he do it? So I saw an amazing piece from Rabbi Rucham Lovavitz, the legendary dean of the Mir Yeshiva in Poland. And he says something incredible that puts, you know, Jacob's accomplishment into an interesting framework, but also gives us a framework or a structure of every amazing and improbable accomplishment. He kind of lays out for us exactly what we need to accomplish something great. Before we get into the piece, let's give some background. The Parsha begins, Jacob leaves Beersheba and travels to Haran. That's where Laban lives. Now, in the next verse, Vayifgaba Makom, he encounters the place and he spends the night there. And of course, he has the memorable dream with the ladder. And we know the story. Now, Rashi, in his comment to the second verse of our Parsha, he records two very unusual miracles that happened to Jacob. He notes that the word for vayivga, the word for prayer, is strange. It means vayivga means to strike or to clash or to encounter. So Rashi explains what does it mean vayivga? It means that he prayed, but why does it use this unusual term to describe Jacob's prayer? Rashi also says, by the way, that Jacob now he institutes, he establishes the evening prayer, Arvit. Why does he use the unusual word vayivgab makom and he prayed in that place when it could have said vayitpalel, a more standard word for prayer? 
says Rashi. This unusual word, Vayivga, is indicating that Jacob had an accelerated journey. The reason why it switches doesn't say Vayit Palel, he prayed. That's coming to teach you that the land jumped towards him. We had two weeks ago in the Parsha, Eliezer, Parsha's Chayisara. He travels to go find a spouse, a wife for Isaac, and the land jumped for him. He had an accelerated journey. Same thing. The miracle happened to Jacob as well. The land jumped for him. His journey was accelerated. That's the first miracle. And then we have a second miracle. He arrived or encountered or prayed at the place, and then he went to sleep there because the sun had set. Says Rashi, what does that mean, because the sun had set? That's telling us that there was a sudden sunset. The sun set prematurely. God wanted Jacob to sleep there in order to have the dream and to see the ladders and the angels going up and down and have the tremendous blessing that Jacob receives in his dream. Now, of course, more miracles follow. The stone pillows, we're told, are fighting. Everyone wants to be the pillow above which Jacob rests his head and God, of course, fuses them into one. But let's focus on the miracle of the accelerated journey. Where exactly was Jacob? So, of course, we know this event, this seminal event of Jacob's life happened on Mount Moriah, on Temple Mount, the exact same place where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, the binding of Isaac's story, on that famous mountaintop. In fact, the verse says that after Jacob wakes up and he makes a vow, He also renames the place, he calls it Beth El, the house of God, and that in fact is one of the names of Temple Mount. The Talmud tells us that Abram, Isaac, and Jacob had three different names for this mountain. Jacob named the mountain a house. Abram originally called it a mountain, Har Yerah. Isaac called it a field, and Jacob called it a house, says the Talmud. This corresponds to the first, the second, and the third temple. The first temple corresponds to Abraham, and it was like a mountain. The second temple corresponds to Isaac, and it was like a field. And the third temple, to be built speedily in our days, corresponds to Jacob, and that is a house. That's the permanent temple, never to be destroyed. So where is Jacob? Where does this amazing nocturnal prophecy with the angels going up and down the mountain and God appearing to him in his dream, where is that happening? It's happening on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But here's the problem that Rashi asks. The verse also tells us that after, it says that Jacob renamed it Bethel, Basel, the house of God, it tells us the original name of the city, and that is Luz. The city used to be called Luz, but now Jacob renamed it Bethel. And here's the problem. Luz is not Jerusalem. So how can Jacob be in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah and rename the mountain, yet also be in the place formerly known as Luz? So Rashi offers a very novel resolution. Jacob was in Luz, and Jacob also was in Jerusalem. Because when it says that the trip was accelerated, the land jumped for him, That doesn't mean that Jacob was ushered from where he was and he went much faster. He fast-forwarded to Temple Mount. Oh no, Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, Jerusalem, uprooted itself from Jerusalem and went to him. Jacob didn't go fast to the mountain. The mountain went fast to him. So the actual land that he was, the place where he was in, was a place called Luz. He renames it Bethel. But it was also on Temple Mount because the way Jacob's trip was expedited, it was that the mountaintop uprooted itself and brought itself to Jacob, who was in Luz, and he renamed that place Bethel. And then I guess the mountaintop picked up and went back west to Temple Mount and once again reestablished itself there. Very interesting Rashi. When Eliezer, he was traveling to Rebecca, and that trip was expedited, he went fast. The people moved fast. Here is a different kind of expedited journey. The land uprooted itself and jumped towards him. Okay, this is really interesting. And Rashi continues with a further question. 
We know that Jacob is traveling from Canaan, from the land that we call today the land of Israel. He's escaping his brother, wants to kill him, and he's traveling east. And if you understand the layout, you would have Canaan, and there in Beersheba. And if you were to travel east from there, you would first encounter Temple Mount. And as you travel further east, you would encounter the city of Luz. And you go even further east, you go to Haran. If you read the verse, it says he went to Haran. And only afterwards did he travel to Bethel, to Luz, to Mount Moriah. It says Rashi something very fascinating. When Jacob passed Temple Mount, why didn't he stop there? Answers Rashi, he did not pay attention. He did not decide to go and pray there. And therefore God said, if you don't want to pray there, I'm not going to force you to pray there. I'll let you go. And he arrived all the way to Haran. He traveled all the way from Beersheba, all the way across the Arabian desert and arrived in Haran. And that's the first verse of our Parsha. Jacob departed, he left Beersheba and he went to Haran. But when he arrived in Haran, he said, oh no, I made a big mistake. Is it possible that I passed by the place, Temple Mount, where my forefathers, where Abraham and Isaac prayed and I didn't pray? So he made a decision. He paid attention. He decided to go back. And he went back and he arrived to Beth El. So he went back further west from Haran back to Beth El, also known as Luz. And when he got there, halfway back, the Almighty expedited it and made the land jump to him, uprooted the mountain and brought it to Luz. So Rashi is explaining Jacob's journey. He left Beersheba, and he's heading east. And he passes Temple Mount, and he doesn't stop there. He continues east, and God says, you know what? If he's not stopping, I'm not going to stop him. And then he continues. He passes Bethel, then called Luz, and doesn't stop there. And he continues east. And again, God lets him go. And he arrives in Haran. He arrives in the city of Laban. And he says, oh no, what did I do? I passed Temple Mount, where Abraham and Isaac prayed. And he doesn't stop there. So he turns around and he travels several days to get back west. And he arrives in Bethel and Luz. And then Temple Mount jumps to him and he prays and the sun sets and he goes to sleep and he has a dream and he wakes up and renames the city, formerly known as Luz. He renames it Bethel. That is the background of how Rashi understands what happened, what the, how Jacob ended up in this place for this nocturnal prophecy. Now the Ramban, he totally disagrees with Rashi. He asks a series of questions. He says, wait a minute, the Talmud makes a list of three people that had the same miracle, that the land jumped or they jumped through the land, they expedited their journey. And how could Rashi say that Jacob's version of this miracle is different than Eliezer's version of this miracle? Question number one. Question number two, the Talmud implies that it was Jacob who was moved fast to Temple Mount, not vice versa. And also, the Ramban asks a third question. It's illogical. Jacob, at least according to Rashi, arrives in Haran, and he turns around, decides to go back to Temple Mount, and he does half the journey manually. And only then, when he's in Beth El, also known as Luz, only then does Temple Mount poured over, jump over, uproot itself, and come to him. Doesn't make sense. If you're going to make a miracle, don't do a half-hearted miracle. So he has a more traditional understanding of what happened in this journey. Take a look at the Ramban at great length. But regardless, everyone agrees that Jacob went all the way to Haran. He arrived in the city of Laban, the destination, and he turned around and either... He immediately jumped to Temple Mount. That's how the Ramban would explain it, the once in three times of history miracle. Or he traveled manually halfway to Luz, and then the mountain atop itself traveled to him. But first he went to Haran and made a decision, a very consequential decision, to turn around. That's the background of this piece in Rebbe Rucham. Now, Rebbe Rucham focuses on a very interesting dynamic in this whole story. He passes Temple Mount on his original journey and it would be very appropriate 
for him to stop and pray, but he fails to pay attention. He doesn't stop, and God says, I'm not going to intervene. And he arrives all the way in Haran, and he gets there, and he says, oh no, is it possible that I made a mistake? Is it possible that I passed by? I traversed the land at the location where Abraham stopped and prayed, where Isaac prayed, and I didn't pray? So he made a decision. He decided to turn around. He retraces his steps, and then a miracle happens. An amazing thing here. God did not nudge him or prompt him to stop initially. Had he done nothing, had he arrived in Haran and said, you know what, I'm here already, let me go find Laban, let's get this process underway. And he didn't turn around. What would have happened in that counterfactual world where Jacob did not turn around? He would never have gotten the dream. He would never have seen the ladders of the ascending and descending angels, and he wouldn't have gotten all those blessings. But he turned around, and he, in fact, did receive those blessings. And what blessings did he get? What did Jacob, and consequently all of Israel, gain thanks to his decision to turn around? So let me read you three verses. Chapter 28, verse 13, 14, and 15. And behold, this is Jacob's dream. Hashem was standing over him, and he said, I am Hashem, God of Abraham, your father, and God of Isaac, the ground upon which you are lying, to you will I give it, and to your descendants. Your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out powerfully westward, eastward, northward, and southward, and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and by your offspring. Verse 15. Behold, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will return you to the soil. I will not forsake you until I will have done what I have spoken about you. This is a pretty robust and meaningful and impactful blessing. God promises to give Jacob and his descendants the land. His descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. You will proliferate and expand in every direction. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. God promises to be with you, to guard you, to bring you back here. God says, I will not abandon you. This is an incredible blessing. This is a blessing that even today we are benefiting from. And the only reason why he got it is because when he arrived in Haran, and he realizes that he made a mistake, he decides to turn around and go back. That triggered miracle number one of expediting the journey, either you know the way Rashi understands it, uprooting the mountain, bring it to him, or the way the Ramban understands it, having him fast forward to Mount Moriah. But then he gets all those miracles. The lever, the trigger, the fulcrum that tipped all those blessings his way was that he made a decision to go back and pray where his forefathers prayed. Is this the most important decision of all time? You know, we see that Jacob's mission in our Parsha is pulled off flawlessly. How did that happen? How was he so successful? Because of this blessing. Because God was with him every single step of the way. God never abandoned him. There were no lapses in the complete divine protection. And how did he earn that? How did he merit that divine Kevlar and blessing? Because he said, oops, I made a mistake. I passed by an important site. I forgot to pray. Let me turn around and go all the way back there. And that small decision completely altered the trajectory of Jacob's life. But truthfully, the trajectory of all Jewish history. Isn't that amazing? One bit of inspiration to go pray. And as a result of that, a tremendous, incredible blessing that not only made Jacob's trip a smashing success, but his descendants are reaping the fruits of that blessing, are benefiting from the dividends of that blessing until today. Now, if you think about it, you know, Jacob was inspired to turn around, go back to Temple Mount. 
It's a very nice thing. But how is it so powerful? Typically, the effort, the investment is going to be commensurate to the output, to the reward. Here, the reward seems to far outshadow the inspiration, the input. There seems to be a symmetry, incongruence between Jacob's inspiration and the fruits that it bore. How do we understand this? So we're going to give you the simple answer, and then we're going to give you the more advanced answer that Rabbi Rucham offers. Jacob was already in Haran. He did the whole very long journey across the whole desert. It most likely took multiple weeks to travel from Beersheba all the way to Haran. He is already at his destination. And he's like, oh no, I forgot to pray. And he went all the way back to go back to the point of origin to go fix that, to go pray. You know, when I started teaching at Torch, all the way back in 2012, I used to present the following dilemma in some of my classes. I would say, you know, how far into your commute, when you realize that you left your phone at home, how far would you have to be to say, you know what, I'll just go to work without my phone and I'll get my phone later on. Today, we don't have that dilemma anymore. Maybe fewer people have a commute, I don't know. Is that true? But more importantly, people view their phone as like an appendage to their body. They're so attached to it, they would never forget it. And you know what? It's so crucial to people's lives, or at least that's what they assume. Even if they arrived at work, maybe they would turn around and still go get it. I remember reading, maybe this is actually good advice. When you're driving your toddler, give your toddler your phone. And you'll have two benefits. Number one, you won't text and drive. And you'll never forget your baby in the car because you'll always remember to get your phone. But the truth is, of course, you know, I'm talking to you. You're part of the Parsha Podcast family. You actually have a very good reason to take your phone with you because, after all, that's how you access the Torch Podcasts. What are you going to do without it? You're going to drive to work and you're going to listen to terrestrial radio with all the ads and all the trite banality of news and weather and traffic and politics and music and talk shows. You're not going to do that. Once you start with podcasting or listening to podcasts, you can never go back. So this is not a good dilemma for you because you have to take your phone with you. And you have a very good, justifiable reason to do so. But listen to this dilemma. Imagine you forgot to pray at your house. And now you are five minutes into your journey. Would you turn around? Or what if you were traveling from Los Angeles to Miami, cross country? And then you remember when you arrive in Miami that, oh no, my parents, when they arrived in Vegas, they would always pray in Vegas. Let me turn around. Could you imagine that? You forgot to pray, and now you are in South Beach. What would you do? Jacob arrives all the way at the end of a multi-week journey. He traveled all the way from Beersheba to Haran. He gets there and says, oh no, I made a mistake. I forgot to pray on Temple Mount. Let me turn around. This is way further than LA to Miami. This is more like the Trans-Siberian Railway. He is several weeks into this journey, and he's several weeks away from Temple Mount, but he turned around nonetheless. It's a very powerful decision, and maybe that's why it is so consequential, why he earned so many rewards, eternal rewards for that decision. Now, Rucham says something a bit more advanced. What is the meaning of Jacob's decision to turn around and go back to pray at the spot where Abraham and Isaac prayed? This is much more than a simple decision to go pray. Rather, this was Jacob making the bold, courageous, and frankly, irrational decision to go found the nation. Jacob girded his loins 
and had the gumption to say, I am hereby going to found the Jewish nation. Not just any nation. The nation of God. The nation that will ultimately receive the Torah. The nation that will ultimately bring the world to its perfection. The nation that will have 12 tribes. There's going to be one person who's going to be renamed Israel who's going to found this nation. I'm going to be that person. That was Jacob's decision to turn around. The Jewish people were always going to be composed of 12 tribes. In fact, Isaac was supposed to found the nation, but the Midrash actually says that Esav, when he was born, he savaged Rebekah's womb so that she will no longer be able to bear children. She'll only have two. Rebekah was really supposed to be the mother of 12 sons, but that didn't work. Jacob was not a shoe in to be the final patriarch, to be the one who becomes Israel, to bear the 12 tribes. This is a role that he chose for himself. When did he choose it? When he arrived in Haran and said, I'm sorry, I'm not just going to here get married, start a family, or even a dynasty. I'm going to found a nation. And what's appropriate for you to do when you are about to do something so grand and consequential is you have to pray at the place where Abraham and Isaac prayed. And he arrived in Haran and he said, you know what? I must turn around. I have to travel three weeks back to Temple Mount. I cannot undertake this ambitious mission without that prayer. Can you imagine what this is like? You finished the long, arduous journey through the desert. You're exhausted. You're famished. You're relieved to finally be at your destination. And you turn around and you make the whole journey back to go pray. Your plan is you're going to pray and then you're going to turn around and retrace your steps to travel back to Haran. The reason why Jacob did that is because he made a choice. He made a bold and audacious choice to become Israel, to become the founder of these 12 tribes. And the only way to do that is if you pray at the same spot where Abraham and Isaac, your antecedents, prayed. The choice that he made to turn around was a choice to say, I am hereby choosing to become Israel, to become the founder of the Jewish people. Can you imagine what kind of guts it takes to undertake that initiative? How much brazenness, how much chutzpah does it take? Says Rabbi Rucham, in the merit of that chutzpah, Jacob unlocked all those miracles and blessings. In the end of chapter 5 of Chapters of Our Fathers, we read, Havi az kanamer, you should be bold, like a leopard, vikal kanesher, and light like an eagle, viratz katsvi, and running swiftly like a deer, vidibor ka'ari, and mighty like a lion to do the will of your Father in heaven. The first step of every grand accomplishment is to be bold, to be brazen, to be gutsy, like a leopard. Normally, you know, the Muslim masters tell us we prize or we strive to be unassuming, to be modest, to walk with modesty with God. <laughs> Jacob, in fact, was praised in last week's parsha for being unassuming and modest. This is totally out of character for him. To say, I am going to be the one who's going to found this nation? That's a very bold and a bit irrational thing to say. But the only way to do something so big, the first step that is needed to undertake something massive, is to be a bit bold and a bit irrational. And to turn around and march back to Temple Mount and say the proper way to found this nation is to first pray where Abraham and Isaac prayed? 
and to banish any timidity and meekness and go for it. Now, Abiruchim contrasts Jacob's boldness with Aaron's diffidence. In Leviticus chapter 9, this is in the beginning of Parsha Shmini, the tabernacle is finally built, and Moshe tells Aaron, Krav al approach the altar and go bring the sacrifices. And Rashi tells us that Moshe was nudging Aaron because Aaron was a bit diffident. He was a bit hesitant. He was unsure. He was justifiably scared to walk into the sanctuary to do the sacrifices. Who could say about themselves that they are in fact worthy of this? Aaron had the understandable uneasiness, uncertainty, bashfulness. Didn't want to do it. Was scared to do it. And Moshe nudged him. This is what you need to do. This is what you were chosen to do. Jacob is bold like a leopard to make this great undertaking. And once he makes that decision, all the paths are opened before him. The land jumped or he jumped. The blessings were given. The obstacles were cleared. His path was set. Now, Abraham brings another example of someone who had this boldness to do things that were crazy, really, frankly, things that were outrageous. And that's in the story of Tamar. We're going to read about it in a few weeks. Tamar is the daughter-in-law of Judah, and she really covets, she craves bearing children from Judah. But her first husband dies because he was a sinner. Her second husband, these are both sons of Judah, also dies because he was also a sinner. Judah assumes that she is dangerous, she's a problem, sends her away, and she realizes that the only way that she can merit to bear children from Judah and to be one of the forebearers of Messiah is if she does something completely unorthodox and completely outrageous. She dresses up like a prostitute and seduces Judah. Now, we're also told by the commentaries, Rashi brings this down, that she was such a modest person, even though she was Judah's daughter-in-law, he didn't know anything about her. He didn't even know what she looked like. That's how modest she was. And this modest girl, this amazing, incredible, noble woman, dresses up like a prostitute, goes to the crossroads, and seduces Judah, and eventually gets what she wanted. How gutsy was this decision? How difficult was this decision? Later on, when she is accused of a crime she did not commit, she was willing to go into a fiery pit, into a furnace to die, and that was hard. Says Rabbi Rucham, the decision to get dressed up like a prostitute was even harder. And this is an example of someone doing something so outrageous and so fiercely bold. The only way that you can unlock something as great as what you got. You got to be bold like a leopard. But being bold is just not enough. There are three more steps that are needed until the mission is completed. You start off by being bold like a leopard. Then you have to take flight like an eagle. You got to run as fast as a deer and to be as mighty as a lion. We're told there was a second woman who was as bold as Tamar, and that is the wife of Potiphar, and she tries to seduce Joseph for the same reasons that Tamar tried to seduce or successfully seduced Judah, but there's a big difference. The wife of Potiphar, she ends up a villain because she did not consummate these four steps. She was bold like a leopard, but she couldn't bring it home. She wasn't mighty like a lion to make sure that this entire process is pulled off without any stumbles. This is the story of our Parsha. Jacob starts off with nothing. But he makes a firm, if totally irrational, decision to go found the Jewish nation. He heads back to pray. He has unlocked step one. 
But the story, of course, is not complete until he navigates the tricky relationship with Laban, which he does with exquisite skill. But he doesn't lose sight of the big picture. And when there's a scandal and his wives were switched and that threatens to derail his plans, he remembers that God promised him that God will be with him and will not abandon him. So he's calm. He maintains his composure. And despite spending two decades with one of the worst villains of all time with Laban, he does not violate even one of the 613 mitzvos. He doesn't steal even a small pin from Laban. He maintains his complete integrity. He never once loses sight of his mission. He has the ferocity, the boldness of a leopard, but he also has the might and the enduring vigilance of a lion. There's a really interesting phenomenon in our Parsha that appears in our Parsha and not even one other time in the whole Torah. And that is that there are no paragraph breaks, no psuchot and stumot as they're called, no breaks in the Torah between sections. What this means is that Jacob did not have any breaks. For 20 years in our Parsha, he never broke character. His vigilance did not yield for a second. He never lost sight of his mission. It was one continuous, uninterrupted mission, and his concentration and his focus never broke. It started off with boldness of a leopard, but it was brought home with might of a lion. There's a fascinating idea over here. You know, we probably think highly of ourselves. We all have an ego. But the truth is, very few of us are completely devoid of imposter syndrome. We're scared. We're hesitant. We're diffident, like Aaron. But the only way that we can ever do something big, accomplish our mission to its fullest, is if we undertake the grand initiative with boldness and gumption. Perhaps, like Aaron, we will need a small nudge from Moshe. But regardless, we have to face the task before us and go do it. We have to be aggressive believers in ourselves. We have to have a bit of a little irrational confidence. And Jacob in our Parsha is the poster boy of what it means to be bold like a leopard. Starts off with nothing. He's naked. He is just a walking stick. At the end of our parsha, he has four wives, 12 children, an abundance of wealth with the nascent nation in tow. All that started when he made a decision to turn around and head back to where his father and grandfather prayed. He had the gumption, he had the chutzpah to believe in himself and to do it. You know, you see when Israelis come to America, You've seen that? Israelis come here. They don't speak the language, or maybe they do with a broken accent, and they don't really know the culture so well, but they almost all of them, to a man and a woman, they have this chutzpah, this boldness, this ferocity, this brazenness to say, I can make it big. I'm going to America, and I'm going to become rich. And you know what? A lot of them pull it off. And us Americans, you know, we have uh, all this ability and familiarity with the culture and language, but this is something we can learn from them. We can learn from Jacob. You have to be bold and aggressive. Believe in yourself. Go for it. And you know what? Once you do that, you can move mountains. This summer, I was, of course, visiting the Northeast. And whenever I go to someone's house, I always gravitate to their bookshelves to see what kind of books they have. And of course, I may or may not have a discerning eye for books. And sometimes, I'm not going to lie to you in the Parsha podcast, sometimes I judge people, you know, by the books that they have or the ones that they don't have. So I was perusing some books and I saw something really interesting. The author was writing how he was always wondering how Jimmy Carter ever became president. 
And of course, I know nothing. We all know that. I know nothing about politics. But he was saying this exact point and kind of stuck with me. He was saying that Jimmy Carter had guts and gumption that far outstripped his abilities. This is the quote. I think of Jimmy Carter. After he lost the election to Ronald Reagan, Carter came to see me in my office. He told me he was seeking contributions to the Jimmy Carter Library. I asked how much he had in mind. He responded, I would be very appreciative if you contributed $5 million. This is in the early 80s. I was dumbfounded. I didn't even answer him. But the experience taught me something. Until then, I'd never understood how Jimmy Carter became president. The answer is that as poorly qualified as he was for the job, Jimmy Carter had the nerve, the guts to ask for something extraordinary. That ability, above all, helped him get elected president. But then, of course, the American people caught on very quickly that Carter couldn't do the job and he lost in a landslide when he ran for re-election. And I want to reiterate, I literally don't know anything about politics. So I don't know if Jimmy Carter was a good president or a bad president, but to me, this was exactly this point. This is the perspective, I think, that Rabbi Rucham is saying here. Most people just simply don't believe at all that they can become president or even run for Congress or invent something and bring it to market or start a company, start a business, take charge in any situation. Most people don't have that confidence. But Jimmy Carter did. He was bold and took initiative. But like we said, that's only the first step. Fortune indeed favors the bold, but you need a lot more than just fortune to bring it home. After you undertake the initiative, you still have to do a lot to steer the project to completion. But nevertheless, there is tremendous power when you undertake something. When you have the outrageous and irrational confidence, that could move mountains. Jacob says, I'm going to do it, and mountains moved. The world reshaped itself to accommodate him. Maybe we can even speculate that last week's Parsha, Jacob was trained by his mother to do the outrageous. Rebecca persuaded him to get dressed up and masquerade as Asav to usurp his blessings. And Jacob, in fact, said, like, if, if he gets caught, he's going to be cursed and damned for all eternity. But he was trained. Go for it. Be absolutely outrageously ambitious. This would too. Of course, he turns around, heads back to the mountain, but then he finally arrives back in Haran and he goes to the well and he sees a massive gargantuan stone on top of the well and he just removes the stone effortlessly. He was someone who just believed in himself. Of course he could do it. And he does. I was thinking, the Rambam, he wrote the Mishnah Torah. In his introduction to Mishnah Torah, he says, this book will incorporate all of oral Torah. How gutsy is that? What kind of guts does it take to embark on such an ambitious project? The writing of the Shulchan Aruch. I'm going to completely organize and render the final rulings of Halacha. Writing the Mishnah Torah, writing any book, opening a yeshiva, even founding a family. Who do you think you are? To undertake something really massive? To add another chain to the link of continuity going back all the way to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The way you do that is by recognizing, I am a descendant of Jacob. I am fierce and bold when needed. Turn around. Head back to the place where your forefathers prayed. Once you do that, the Almighty will bend the world to accommodate your ambitions. Of course, That's just the start. You still need a lot to bring it to fruition, but that boldness, that brazenness sets you on the right path, unlocks the blessings, creates the miracles, gives you the opportunity to actualize your dreams. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. I still have to struggle to say A and Q. Exquisite insight. And it comes from the episode at the beginning of this is Parsha. Jacob renames the city 
Bethel. It was previously called Luz, and now he calls it Bethel. Says the Midrash, what is this city of Luz? Luz is the city, says the Midrash, in which you dye the trellis, the special trellis wool that you use to make the tzitzis. You do it in the city of Luz. Luz is the city that Sancheirev, who reorganized the entire world, he didn't conquer the city. Nebuchadnezzar, that destroyed the entire land, did not destroy the city. Luz is the city that even the angel of death has no control over. The people, the inhabitants of the city of Luz, they get to choose when they die. When they're ready to go, they leave the city, they go outside of the city, only then they can die. This is the one city, the city of Luz, we're told in the Midrash, that the angel of death has absolutely no control over. The Talmud, the book of Sotah, page 46b, tells us that there was a perhaps, apparently, at least, different city called Luz with the same characteristics. Again, we're told there's a city, city of Luz, mentioned in the book of Judges. And again, it tells us these four things. The color of the Tcheles, Sancheirab, was not able to reassemble the city or move it around. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't destroy it. And even the angel of death has no control over the city. There is a city, or at least the concept of a city, called Luz, that is immune to the angel of death. Sancheirev and Nebuchadnezzar cannot touch it. And that is where you die, Tcheles, wool. What does this all mean? So there's another really interesting midrash. This is in Vayikra Rabba 18.1. It tells us that the Roman emperor Hadrian was crushing bones human skeleton, human bones. And he asked the great sage, Rabbi Yehoshua bar Hanania, where does the Almighty blossom man in the future? In the future, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. What is the kind of beginning of the blossoming of man anew? So he tells him, it's from a bone called Luz, not the city of Luz, but the bone called Luz, which is, part of the spine. He says, is that true? So the emperor was a bit incredulous. He says, bring me that bone. So they brought him the bone and he put it in water and it didn't become brittle. And then he tried to grind it and it didn't become dust. And then he tried to burn it in a fire and it wouldn't get consumed. And then he said, you know what? I'm really going to destroy this loose bone. He put it on an anvil and he tried to shatter it with a hammer, but the anvil and the hammer snapped, but not the Luz bone. There is an indestructible little bone called Luz that will serve as a seed for the future body blossoming from the ground in the resurrection of the dead. This Luz bone, it's somewhere along the spine, either on top or on bottom, according to the Kabbalists, it's right under the tefillin at the top, of the spine. Others say it's at the very bottom of the spine, but there is this bone, really small bone, we're told, that serves as the seed for the future you after the resurrection. Now, why does this loose bone have this tremendous property of being the one that reinvigorates the body and resurrects the body? So we're told in the commentaries that this is a completely spiritual bone. It only consumes nutrients from spiritual meals, specifically the Malava Malka meal that we eat after Shabbos. There's one meal a week that we eat when we're totally full. You've just been binging on food the whole Shabbos. Shabbos is over, you make Havdalah, and you're supposed to make another meal called the Malava Malka meal. That meal... It's just a spiritual meal because there's no physical appetite for any food then. And it's just a mitzvah. There's no desire at all. And the spiritual bone only consumes from the spiritual meal. Of course, what does this have to do with anything? Here's the insight. Not quite the exquisite insight, just the insight number one. When was death decreed upon mankind? When did man become condemned to have to die? 
with the sin of the eating of the tree of knowledge, with the sin of Adam. Well, when was that? When did Adam eat from the tree of knowledge? Well, that was Friday afternoon. And Adam consumed the fruit, and that was absorbed by every part of Adam's body, Adam and Eve as well. And that food, that consumption, that nutrients was like venom, and every part of your body that consumed from that fruit is now condemned to suffer from death as a result of it absorbing that part of the fruit, absorbing the fruit of sin. But again, there's one part of your body, the Lisbon, that only eats Saturday night. So when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, the Lisbon did not consume anything. And therefore, it did not eat from the sin, and therefore, death was not decreed on this bone. Therefore, in this bone, it's still working with the assumptions that man is supposed to live forever. The Kabbalists elaborate, this bone is the opposite of the rest of the body. When you are alive, it seems dead. A person eats something and every part of the body is trying to fetch some bit of nutrients and the loose bone says, I don't want any of it. It appears to be dead when the body is alive. It does not partake in the consumption of food. But when you're dead, all the rest of the body is dead, it is still alive. It is death-resistant. And thus, the concept of luz, both the luz bone and the luz city, are the same. They are all death-resistant. Sancheireb can touch it. Nebuchadnezzar can touch it. Tcheles is the color that symbolizes eternality. That is where it's done, the city of luz. The angel of death has no way to enter the city because like the luz bone, the luz city is death-resistant. Now, Jacob, he renames the mountain Beth El, but the city used to be called Luz. Chapter 28, verse 19, the beginning of our parsha, Ve'ulam Luz Shem Ha'ir Larishana. However, Luz was the name of the city initially. So the Kabbalists tell us something really fascinating. The Ve'ulam, the word Ve'ulam, which means, however, those four letters, Vav, Aleph, Lam, and Mem, they stand for Vene'eman Ata Lahacha Yosmeisim. This is the word that we say in our prayer, and you are trustworthy to revive the dead. Ve'ulam, we trust you to revive the dead. And the verse continues, Luz Shem Ha'ir Lerishana. Luz Shem Ha'ir Lerishana. Luz was the name of the city initially, but the word Ha'ir, which means the city, can also refer to waking up. Like hit or root to wake up. So you could read this verse, Ve'ulam, and the resurrection of dead will happen, or Luz is the beginning of the resurrection. The first to wake up is the Luz. Fascinating stuff here. That's the exquisite insight. The exquisite insight is that hinted to in our parish, the Kabbalists tell us, is this idea of the Luz bone being the first one to awaken from the dead. Now, it's interesting, Jacob, the Talmud tells us, he never died. He represents the Luz. If you look later on the Parsha, when Jacob is manipulating the mating environment of the animals, chapter 30, verse 37, it tells us that Jacob made sticks out of Luz tree. Vayikach lo Yaakov makel lach viluz. He took Luz, which is an almond tree, but again, the same word, Jacob is forever associated with this idea. Jacob is resistant to death. Now, one more important point, or maybe two more important points. For the wicked people who don't have any spirituality in their lives, this bone is never fed. If you're not spiritual in your lifetime now, the loose bone will die and wither even when you are alive. And finally, some say that cremation actually does destroy it. And therefore, if this is pertinent to you, do not make that tragic and short-sighted decision of getting a cremation. If grandma or grandpa really want to get cremated, violate their will. Bury them in a Jewish burial ceremony. They will thank you forever. So that's the end of this week's Parsha podcast. And I know you wanted to be calm and measured and reserved. And withdrawn. And I just, I, I couldn't do it. I tried. 
I could not do it. I'm too excited. What an amazing parasha. What an amazing lesson. Thank you, Rabbi Rocham, for this incredible idea. Be bold and fierce like a leopard. This amazing insight. This exquisite insight of the Lisbon. I thank you for listening. Have an amazing rest of your day. Have a fantastic and splendid and sensational and incredible and outrageously enjoyable Shabbos of coming. And please, with help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.